Hello, I am Andrew Platt, and this is one of my first videos for this topic. Uh, this is a fairly long video, um, I'm going to try and keep it fairly concise, um, and it's all to do with history, okay? But not just any history, this is to do with spiritual spirituality and also science and where science comes from. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about where secret societies and the practices and everything else comes from um, and it all comes from uh, the base of science and um, through self-development and enlightenment and so on so um, what you'll find is a a lot of writers um, you know very good um, at researching and what they'll do is they're usually from a certain area say for example from freemasons or their specific goal is to prove where alchemy comes from or from the Illuminati or, or the Rosicrucians or anything like that. Um, and so what they do is they try and prove that their, um, their, their social structure and their belief system and everything else comes from the very beginning of time, which is actually true. Um, they all do and they all come from the same place, uh, which is extremely interesting and the point of this topic. So what I'm trying to do here is to create unification. Now the problem is when somebody's from, for example, the Freemasons um, decides to research their, their own path, um, they will never kind of accept that their path has changed. Their, their structures carried on, their system, their um, uh, their, 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 say cult or whatever you want to call it, uh, carries on, um, but somewhere along the line there was a separate part of that in, internal structure that disappeared and changed to something else which then carried on and changed with the times effectively. So the original um, setup of the people who made it carries on, but the original intention changes and moves on and basically renames and restructures and reorganises so it allows to um, continue in society without, you know, becoming um, outlawed or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to go through that today. You'll also find that it is a very important subject because all basis of science today comes from these principles. Um, we're, we're not we're going to ignore the, well, I say ignore, we're going to mention, but we're not going to focus on the uh, religious aspects, uh, which gets um, very political and you know, kind of ties everything up, especially uh, with the instance of talking about like Jesus and Moses um, and Abraham and everybody else like that. It can become very messy subject as people can become closed off as they think you're trying to disprove their religion. And that is not the case. Um, I fully support that these people did exist in some form or another. Um, but the, we have to cut through that, that mythological um, background, that over-exaggeration, um, those concepts that you know, kind of explode a simple idea and make it into something else that isn't, well, so unbelievable, but makes it more divine and less scientific. I'm going to try and look at this as a scientific point of view, uh, as that's what I do. I try and root through, but I have the added um, benefit of coming from a spiritual background, um, I come from the one of the other lines of knowledge, the Chinese line of knowledge and the Little Nine Heaven system. So I can relate to the spiritual practices that have been performed and passed on through um, different uh, meditations and, and everything else. And through other sources that I have, I've been able to gather quite a lot of sufficient evidence that can, you know, kind of prove this is where it comes from and, you know, look at it from different, like an outside perspective, as opposed to um, from inside one of these organizations themselves. So I'm quite happy to, I say quite happy, uh, you know, we're all from the same place, we all study the same knowledge. So it's just a case of enlightening people and making sure we know what they're practicing and where it comes from and try and cut through the ignorance and the closed mindedness that, um, that brings the occult to, you know, people being burned at the stake and all that sort of thing. I mean, that did happen, as we'll see, but it's not about that. It's about what people practice, um, and it's all about self-development. Um, so you'll find that things like alchemy turn into chemistry and biology. You know, physics um, it is from basic principles of, of biomechanics and um, effectively martial arts from the Chinese line. 
and you'll see that true science today comes from these principles. The only difference is at the time didn't have the scientific technology to maybe prove them or you know understand them in certain ways. So we explain them in a more mythological way uh, to get through to the general population at the time. Okay, so I'm going to start right back at the beginning. All right, so um, through various sources, bits and pieces, everyone describes the flood as the beginning of civilization, and this is kind of true. To me, the flood, um, from a scientific point of view, is when the ice caps started to melt. All right, and that gives us kind of this um, clean slate to work with. All right, anything before that, again, we cannot prove. You know, a lot of it we can prove. In, in this, um, in the research that I've done, there's still a few big gaps in there, but I'm just trying to link it all together as a long-term project. Um, so a lot of the work I've done and the dates I've got are from other people's research and my own research as well. So they're as close to the point as I can possibly get them. Um, yeah, so the flood is like a clean slate. Imagine all civilization gone is the start of everything. There is nothing, nothing here on Earth. Okay, we're talking, you know, like eight thousand BC, really, really, you know, primordial time. Okay, so on this time we have the the continent, right? The main continent of Europe. We're just going to look at Europe in this video and not Asia and everywhere else. So you have all these different tribes walking around and living, okay? They all live in relative harmony. There's no need to steal. Resources are abundant. Population is down. Everyone's trying to survive. Yeah, we're passing on. Uh, every tribe has like a shaman, and each shaman has access to knowledge um, from spiritual and through scientific practice and experimentation. If you um, uh, medicine and healing and also you know, social and psychological because he's dealing with his tribe all day long and he is sort of resolving problems, you know, he's guiding them where to eat, uh, where to farm, everything else like that. So it, it really is the centre of the tribe and a lot of knowledge is being passed to him. So as all these different tribes wander around, they cross paths, they share knowledge, you know, they're kind of practising, they're learning their own system from wherever they are kind of moving around from. So that's kind of happening all over um europe and the continent now what happens is for whatever reason um a few of these tribes decide to set up shop together and this happens around the year 4000 bc okay so that's like six thousand years ago so quite quite a while ago and this is considered the very first civilization after the flood um and this is happened in mesopotamia uh, or samaria which is kind of around the Iran Pakistan area okay and this was the very first and has been proven that is where civilization started the very first main city so what happens is people build houses they come together they start and they begin to share knowledge yeah because why why live in a society that isn't trying to help each other okay so we're trying to build this city you know all these shamans get together they work out the best way to do um, medicine the best way to heal this particular um, illness and this particular illness and work with this and, and we're literally building a source of information and the best way to to effectively self-develop people as well and the best way to become more spiritual to become a better people as it were and that's physical energetic and spiritual as well so we've got all three planes being discussed by these shamans um, they finally get together for example and make a one line of knowledge and this knowledge is described as the definitive line the best way at that time in that era to practice um, self-development okay so that is our starting point the cradle mesopotamia 4000 bc all right i'm just trying to run over this quite quickly so we can get through because there's a lot of information here um so uh, this happens for a while and then in about 3600 bc um, the very first colony is set up and that is in Egypt, okay, because Mesopotamia wants to grow, needs more resources as it's quite big now, lots of people join, so it needs to spread out a little bit, bring in more resources. So it sets out three colonies, um, one of these colonies is Egypt, the other one is Indus, which is the start of our Indian line, and also in China, um, with the Yellow Emperor over there, and that's our third line of knowledge, okay? So this one line becomes three lines, and we're just gonna work on the 
western sides of the Egypt side now. All right, so what happens is the Egyptian culture begins to develop, all right, and that happens till about 2000 BC, okay, um, and they're developing side by side. Now, they've took their knowledge, but it's a different place, different culture, people over like a thousand years um, develop new ways of doing things. So it becomes a little bit more advanced, um, but different, yes, yeah? so we're both working two different lines of knowledge, one in Mesopotamia and one in Egypt, both developing side by side from the same source okay now what happens is in uh, 1852 BC um, roughly but Mesopotamia begins to decline through famine um, as all great cultures will eventually become an end so what happens is um, people from Mesopotamia jump ship okay and what they do is they run to their closest colony which happens to be Egypt now Egypt takes them in um, and the guy who leads this migration is called Abraham all right as we all know from the Bible so Abraham takes his um, his Jewish people which are now the beginning uh, or the end of the the line from Mesopotamia okay so Mesopotamia has ended um, everything else after that is just kind of an afterthought in that area so the main line goes to Egypt so there's already a line living there so what happens if uh, although you know it's been a thousand years since they kind of had relative contact of a new view from that area so they see these um, Jews as um, immigrants yeah they don't like them they're, they're gonna oh no they're gonna steal our jobs blah 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 um, so they they basically um, the Jew means like from across the sea, basically, from from um, Mesopotamia. So they set up shop in Egypt, and obviously Egyptians aren't too happy about it. So they don't give them the opportunities that, you know, the, the natives would have. So they become a slave race, all right, as horrible as that is, that happened. Um, so what happens is the Jewish are developing their system at the same time. The Egyptians are developing theirs in the same area. So we have this melting pot this cultural melting pot and the open-minded people who are doing self-development understand this and they are probably a little bit more cooperative than the general population okay because we have to understand that self-development you know gives us a higher morality i suppose so we feel more openly about all ways of life so what happens is you have this inner group working together sharing ideas working the two sciences together to develop Whereas the outside culture uh, doesn't see that at all and they just hate each other. Simple as that. So this carries on for quite a while. Okay, and there's certain telltale signs about people passing on the knowledge. This goes on from generation to generation, and you'll get people um, that have a significant benefit to the population, to the community through science and this is usually people that are involved in the line of knowledge being passed on. Obviously it gets passed on to everybody as well at the same time but actually it, it stays with a few people that contribute quite heavily as we go. Now um, the first of these recorded is a pharaoh in fact um, and he is called, um, let me have a look at this sorry, uh, Amen Kotep the fourth Okay, and he actually changed his name to Akhenaten. All right, Akhenaten. Um, the last part of the name changes from. Um, he changes his name because he believes in the sun, and the sun is always described as a pure form of alchemy and the progression of the line. Okay, so he changes his name, and he also becomes the high priest, which he changes the whole religious concept. All right, he's hated for it because it's it's massive change, as with big change. There is always conflict, and conflict is well documented, always. So that's where we get our information from. Um, so Akhenaten becomes the first one to kind of change his idea. He also comes up with the idea of the city of the sun, which is a city which he will build, um, which is uh, a balanced, you know, enlightened city. Everybody loves each other. It's all balanced. Everything works. It's all good. Basically, uh, a new Shambhala. Um, and that is the dream. Unfortunately, he gets killed by his priests uh, because they don't like him very much because he's trying to change their way of life. You know, they believe in one thing. He wants everyone to believe in something else, even if it's better. It's not always accepted because he's trying to he's trying to merge the two lines together, the line from Abraham and the Egyptian line. And he's trying to put it together in a new form. 
and there's lots of evidence to support this fact. Um, so his son gets put onto the throne, and he has his name changed back to the old um, to the old name uh, because he is a puppet kind of pharaoh, and he's been placed there by the priests. Okay, um, so the city of the sun idea dies now. Shortly after this, uh, Moses arrives and. What we think of Moses is he takes the Jewish people away from Egypt because he sees it as, you know, Egyptians, it's too late for them. They can't really evolve from that. We've already tried to change once. It's not going to happen again. So we need to get out of here and start again. So what Moses does, he is the next in line and he has the knowledge of all both, both the lines together. So he decides that um, he is going to take his people, the Jewish people, and he's going to take them home. I mean, he is actually Egyptian, um, so it's the perfect blend of the two. All right, he's had access to both lines of knowledge. This is um, written in more detail in, in other sources that you can, can look at. All right, um, so what he does, he takes the Jewish people away and he takes them over the sea back home, in fact, to Mesopotamia, because at that time, Mesopotamia has gone. Babylonia has formed, but it doesn't take up the same space that Mesopotamia took. So his plan is to take his Jewish people back to Jerusalem, um, the city of Jerusalem, which isn't actually a city, it's more like a little village. Um, and that's where he will rebuild because it was on the edge of their homeland, but isn't now populated as he doesn't want to go back to Babylonia. Because if he goes back to Babylonia, the same thing will happen with Egypt. And they'll probably be taken as slaves, blah, 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 and there'll be conflict. So start fresh in a new area, which is actually an old area. So he does this and he takes the Ark of the Covenant, which is very important because it carries two tablets. Two being very important because we only ever talk about one. And one is the Ten Commandments. Okay. The other tablet is the Emerald Tablet, which was formed by Foth before the Great Flood and hidden in one of the Egyptian pillars which he made um, and that's very important because it's the source of all science today uh, which you know it's important <laughs> so um, yeah he takes these two tablets and he takes them to Jerusalem and he pops them in their city okay and there's, there's a lot to go on there this is quite a summarized version now the city of Jerusalem flourishes all right because he has the new line of knowledge he has all the uh, science behind him and, and the world to survive it's a new civilization they grow and grow and grow he passes it on through line, you know, successor after successor. And then we get to King David, the first real king of Jerusalem. And we see it as a proper nation. Now, King David um, did a lot of work uh, with science um, and you know, building the civilization. But his son was most known as King Solomon. Now, King Solomon was a highly spiritual man and had access to higher spiritual powers, apparently, with demons and uh, yeah able to access angels and all sorts of things but he also knew alchemy and the reason we know this is because he created the seven seals of the seven planets but also he was the very first person um bear in mind when moses brought over um not moses abraham, uh, abraham brought over the jews from mesopotamia also brought with him the jewish language the hebrew language and this was made into the, um, it's got 22 letters and 10, is it 10? Yeah, the 10, the 10 um, letters, okay? And those form um, what we now call the Kabbalah. So Solomon was the first person to put the Kabbalah writing into actual uh, topographic uh, form, which is a geometrical uh, interpretation of the body and progression, which is very important because it starts the basic of all mathematics um, okay so the Hebrew letter is the beginning of mathematics when he put it into physical form it created the first topographic shape and we get you know dimensions and three-dimensional objects and all sorts of that um, triangles Pythagoras everything is built off that so Solomon is the first person to do that which is very very important um, he was also the first person to build a temple dedicated to Jehovah, um, and Jehovah obviously means God, um, and the universe, and no one was allowed in there except for Jehovah and God himself, and the high priest once every few years. Um, in this room was stored the ark, okay? Now, during one of the, uh, it was loads of times people tried to take over Jerusalem, because it was very important, obviously, for many reasons, including spiritual. 
Um, so at one point it was about to be taken, so he hid the Ark and was never heard from again. There was a dummy Ark sent out, and that is supposedly in Ethiopia. Um, that is not the real Ark. Uh, it can't be because if it was, then no one would have had access to the knowledge, and nothing we would have had today could have existed. Um, and, you know, so the Ark was disappeared for a while, but the knowledge was passed on through King Solomon. At the same time King Solomon was about, there was Hiram. Hiram, there was two Hirams. One of them was a builder and the other one was not. Uh, Hiram of Tyre, which was the Phoenician king. He set up shop and helped uh, King Solomon build the temple, build Jerusalem. So them two were very on the same page. Okay, So I firmly believe that um, Hiram of Phoenicia also had access to the old um Mesopotamian line, if there was one, um, carried on from there. And then he merged it with King Solomon's line. Okay, so the two lines became one. Now, what happened was King Solomon passed his knowledge on through generation, through generation. Okay, and there's various um, mentions of, of his sons and grandsons and followers doing great deeds. Some didn't, some did. Um, there's also lots of mentions of various prophets that come in and help him. So if it wasn't kept within his family line itself, it was certainly kept nearby through priests and such, depending on, on you know, if the, if the um, next generation was, dizzy, um, was seen as unfit, they will pass it on to a priest or someone who was, and then will pass it back later on. So this happened for quite a while. Uh, at the same time, um, Hiram of uh, Tyre, of uh, Phoenicia, uh, built Carthage and Carthage was set up at 500 BC okay so he he built Phoenicia up and then he built Carthage as like a colony and Carthage kind of spread all the way across the top of Egypt um, and Africa and to the bottom of Spain Granada which is very important later on as you will see um, so this was kind of an expansion of Phoenicia so we have two lines we have the Jerusalem line which is very important and we have the Phoenician line okay and the Carthage line um, the Carthage was said to be baby eaters and child sacrifice, which is a load of media rubbish set up by the Romans when they invaded, so they, people didn't feel bad when they killed them all and took over. Um, so that's an important one to look up. Uh, just before that, though, in 650 BC, Zoroaster disappeared from Egypt. And Zoroaster was quite important because he also... Um, carried a line. He he carried his knowledge back to Iran. So we actually have three lines going on here. Um, they kind of sit there for a bit in Persia, uh, Zoroaster, um, and we have the two lines: one in Carthage and one in Jerusalem. Okay, with the ark still buried underneath. Now uh, we go all the way through to 597 BC, where uh, I'm not good with his names, just Sunna, um, is the last descendant of Solomon. And he gets put into prison uh, and overthrown, and that's the end of Jerusalem's reign. In okay, case so what happens there, he goes into prison, and he is most likely the last reigning person in the line, and he needs to pass his knowledge on to somewhere. Okay, uh, So we also find out... Obviously, Carthage is developing then. Um, we also find out then that Alexander the Great starts to appear in Greece. So, um, the most likely source is that this guy, this descendant of Solomon, uh, being in captivity, knows that's it. Jerusalem's gone. He can't do anything about it. He needs to pass on his knowledge. So, he either passes it on to someone in prison to go and take it outwards, or he gave it to someone before he went in prison, and they took it out outwards as well, um, because I think he died in prison. So, there's no way he could have passed it on himself. Um, so, he, he gave it to someone else to then pass on for him. Now, the next big civilization at the time was, in fact, Greece. All right, so Greece is up and coming. Um, at the same time, Carthage is kind of building at the same time. So, what happens is um, these two lines are developing uh, and it's been taken to Greece. And in Greece, we have uh, Pythagoras. Okay, Pythagoras is the inventor of the triangle angles. He also knows all this other spiritual development stuff. So, he definitely got the knowledge from the Jerusalem line because there's, there's no other way he could have known these things without having the access to, to the level of knowledge that he did. Um, so, he must have been past it 
uh, from this line, okay? Um, also, he had probably access to Carthage as well because the Carthage trades and all over, so they, they've got access to everywhere. So he's kind of got uh, access to both of these lines, okay? Um, so what happens is that Pythagoras, you know, um, builds builds up the line in Greece, uh, and it is lot, there's lots of people like Plato. Um, Plato appears in Greece as well in 428. Okay, and what he does, he develops the system even more, and he comes up with all these um, different ideas, um, you know, that come from the knowledge and alchemy and everything else. So we know that definitely Greece in that time had the line of knowledge. Okay, uh, so from that, the expanding culture of Greece it just explodes. We have Alexander the Great, and he conquers everywhere. He conquers all around the Mediterranean Sea, so all around Egypt, everywhere. And he stops when he gets to Jerusalem. He stops in his tracks. And, you know, he, he finds something, he finds this information, he finds this line, and he's searching. Maybe he'd learn off Plato and everyone else, but there was this hidden treasure in Jerusalem still, this ark. So he spreads all the way across, finding artifacts, everything else, and he finds, um, you know, he goes to Jerusalem. He doesn't find the ark, unfortunately, because the ark is still there. We, we know the ark is there because the conflict in Jerusalem carries on for many, many years to try and find the ark so it's definitely still there he doesn't find it but he finds the priests um he probably finds people who know about the line all this knowledge and then what he does he, he basically moves his center to egypt because he knows that's where it comes from if you study the line you know where it's been you know where it's come from all right so he goes to egypt and he builds the library of alexandria and alexandria his his city of sun taken from um uh, Akhenaten's uh, City of the Sun as well. So he's taking reference from that old idea. So he's definitely the next in line there. And he sets up this library and it, it's it's filled with alchemy texts and hermetic texts and everything to do with the occult and science and everything else. It's all gathered there. It's a big lighthouse type, type structure. Um, it's very important. This is the centre of everything. This is scholarly work. He promotes um, promotes work on the Kabbalah, promotes everything, you know, shared interest in Judaism and everything else that's going on at the time. So this really is the epicenter of cultural growth, okay, um, in Egypt at the time. And that's out right in the north. Now, uh, as we go through... Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so... All right, so in 237 BC, we have the man called Orpheus, and Orpheus is a very clever spiritual man, and he grew up in Greece. So he takes a trip to Egypt at exactly the same time the Edfu Temple was built, and the Edfu Temple has been proven to contain knowledge from, obviously, the Egyptians and you know, the other line, Carthage line, and everything else, all these developed systems, and it's all written on the walls, things that they couldn't possibly know unless they had access to this higher knowledge. But, you know, there's all sorts about um, development, self-development, spirituality, meditations, science, um, chemistry, biology, physics, all this sort of thing is written down on these walls, and um, it, it, it's just... Uh, a temple devoted to self-development and that's in Edfu and that's south south Egypt so what he's done he's come over and he's built this temple and he's helped to um to kind of bring all the knowledge back to one area so he brings it all back to this place and from that as soon as the Edfu temple is built spirituality becomes the prime export of Egypt okay everybody loves Egypt they're trying to get spiritual but you know we're trying to um, absorb all the knowledge from Egypt. It becomes, you know, the, the, the center, the absolute center of knowledge and progression. All right, and that's a combination of of the Greek and Egyptian lines put together. So we're getting this big melting pot of everything going on, very much like the first civilization. Um, so what happens is Carthage is still going on, and the next big city, uh, the next big culture is Rome, and Rome starts to develop very, very small, not not really that big of a, of a nation. Um, and what Rome does, it decides it wants to expand. So, bang, what it does, it invades Carthage, and it destroys it completely. And it takes over all the lands, including South Spain, which it currently held. And you can be pretty sure that um, the reason um, 
Tarth is spread to South Space to get this knowledge as far as it can. So the, there's these artifacts, there's knowledge, there's people holding the line in, in South Spain. And um, so after invading Carthage, um, Rome, the society of Rome needs this, this whatever information it's got, and it knows that there's something in Spain. So rather than, it just jumps to Spain for no reason. It conquers South Spain without conquering any of the neighbouring countries. Um, so it knows that it needs to conquer Spain because there's something in Spain where it wants and it needs to, to progress because it knows um, from people that it would have divulged the knowledge that anyone who has the line of knowledge becomes a successful civilization. Okay, and that seems to be the trend all the way through. So um, yeah, they they conquer Spain and they conquer Carthage. Carthage is no more. Phoenicia is no more as well. So now you have Egypt. And kind of Rome sat around with a little bit of knowledge. Okay, so um, after that we have Jesus in kind of Jerusalem area. Okay, and Jer Jesus is a very important person. He's a prophet, and, and he definitely existed because he's in he's written in, in all sorts of different um, texts from e e both lines. In fact, from all all three lines, do mention Jesus at some point or another. So he was definitely about at the time. Um, he was definitely a character, all right? Uh, cutting through all the mythology, um, all the religious stuff, we, we don't look at that, we just look at the facts, okay? Um, and Jesus did some amazing things. He could heal, um, you know, he could do scientific things that nobody else could do. And this, to me, says that he was the top of the, top of the line here. Um, he definitely had access to... Um, the Order of Messini, and the Order of Messini lived on the Black Sea. And what happened to them is they were a cult of healers and alchemists and science-based people. And he definitely learned off them. Um, and it's been it's been documented that he was part of their group, and he learned how to how to apply these techniques. So he would have got the knowledge or the access from the knowledge from here, which was from Jerusalem at the time. So maybe some of these priests escaped to this area, and they were continuing practicing. There's other few cities that are mentioned as well, that right near the Black Sea, but also have um, Hermeticum roots. That um, when uh, when the Romans and that came over um, to take over, they were asked, you know, which god do you support? And he goes, oh, we support science, and they're like, okay, and then they just let them carry on, um, as opposed to say we like God or you know Jehovah or whatever. So uh, there's definitely cities around the Black Sea that were still practicing. Um, the scientific spiritual development, uh, as well as obviously Egypt. So in the years that Jesus was missing, um, he would have learnt off the Order of Messini, and then he would have gone to, he would have learnt that there was more knowledge out there. So he'd have gone to Egypt, he'd have learnt from Egypt. He may have even travelled to India, um, we don't know. But he came back and he had all this knowledge, and you know he was trying to promote goodness and well-being and everything else. Um, he was trying to build his own city of the sun effectively through people. Um, not preaching, but you know, teaching people. He had these 12 disciples, um, and he was passing on the knowledge to them and everybody else, okay? And these feats that he did may have just been scientific experiments that he did in front of people, which maybe just got over-exaggerated, okay? Um, who knows? Can't prove that. Don't know. Doesn't matter. All right, so uh, shortly after Jesus appeared in Jerusalem, 60 years later, the Romans invaded and they conquered Jerusalem with the knowledge that they got from Carthage and Spain. So they knew they had to take Jerusalem, they had to. So when Jerusalem started to decline, boom, they took over and they got it. And they took over in search for the Ark, which again, they did not find because Solomon hid it so well, um, which is quite impressive, really. So... Yeah, they, they burnt the place to the ground um, and they took pretty much all the artefacts and there's the Black Sea Scrolls, if anyone's ever, ever seen the Black Sea Scrolls, the Copper Scrolls, uh, and that is basically a list of hidden treasure places where the Jews hid treasure around the world in Egypt and then went back and got it and then used it to set up Jerusalem again after the Romans had gone. So the Romans went away thinking they'd stolen all the wealth of Jerusalem um, in fact, they didn't. They just took a small fraction of it. Uh, so they took that back to Rome. And with that money, they built the Colosseum and Rome expanded massively. Um, they have recently found evidence that there was a plaque um, and it said uh, the Colosseum was built with money from 
the spoils of Jerusalem. Okay, so that, that Emperor Titus, he, he took it uh, and he, he built a new Rome with it. All right, so um, obviously Christianity then arose uh, from Jesus and also Gnostic uh, Gnostic beliefs. Now, I firmly believe that Gnostic beliefs and Christian beliefs are exactly the same, just a different way about it. One is more spiritual and higher. Uh, they believe in angels and all that. The other one is more science-based, Gnostic, um, agnostic, whatever you want to call it. And they, they practiced alchemy and science in their own way ritual based you know that's that where the spiritual part comes from it's not clinical like science today very ritualistic and self-development um so there's a lot of incantations and, and you know it's also do with cleansing the soul and everything else like that as you go so um the gnostics uh, existed side by side with the christians now the christians becoming more popular um, in belief they managed to outlaw gnostic um, gnostics in 200 ad and they were Considered witches and heretics and burnt at the stake, which was lovely, simply because they looked at the universe in a different way and they believe that God comes from science and the universe and everything else and not as an actual person or being. So, you know, whatever view you take is fine. Um, but that's what they did. Um, the Christians condemned the Gnostics and burnt them at the stake. Um, Emperor Constantine then decided that Christianity was the major religion just because it was becoming so popular and he, instead of creating more, he wanted to create peace, unification, so he just de decreed that everybody will be a Christian in, in his land. So in 272 uh, AD, he got everyone together and they formed what was in the Bible out of all the passages written and that was basically the official Christian kind of start. Yeah, that, that was when Christianity started, when the Bible was officially written. Um, yeah, so you know, it took 270 years for Jesus' teachings to become two lines, Gnostic and Christian, and they already hated each other by then. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> Gnostics went into hiding. They still practiced, um, even though condemned, because they knew it was the right thing to do. So they carried on, passed the line in secret, just as it had been in previous times. Um, da, 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 da. So after the Bible was written, Gnostics felt if they carried on saying what they were, they were, they were all going to die. So they changed the name to uh, Mithraism. Um, and Mithraism was a new religion uh, or practice which is exactly the same as Gnostics, um, but with a different name. And that was taught in the Roman army. Um, a lot of Roman soldiers, including all the way into Britain and Germany, practiced uh, the Gnostic um, practices. Yeah, we all practice science. And they carried that on in secret, effectively. So, oh yeah, Christians, oh, it's not Gnostic, it's something else, so we'll let them do it. You know, slightly ignorant, but, you know, we're not going to complain, we're not getting killed anymore. So, everybody's working at their own thing. Um, this carries on, uh, and, it, you know, it kind of just, the science kind of just kind of wanders around a little bit over the... Uh, Roman Empire, there's no significant advances, it's just kind of getting on with it and keeping it alive. On the other hand, uh, there's a roaster which we forgot about, uh, don't forget about him. He was still in Iran and Persia and he passed his line on to a guy who basically then built the, ha the Hagia Sophia, okay? And that was, again, it was a copy of Solomon's Temple, right? it was exactly the same. So. Um, all the information in it, it was all hermeticum, it was all from alchemy, it was all from um, spiritualization and self-development, and, and that grew, and that was like kind of the point that said, we are here, this is us, this is our line, okay, we are now the dominant line, all right. So what happened was all these, um, it was kind of on the border of Roman Roman influence was, was um, like the Persian, so uh, the, the most likely thing is all these, uh, ex Gnostics, these Mithraism uh, had moved down to the border, away from away from Italy, away from there to get away, yeah, because they want to keep their knowledge alive, and the best way to do that is far away from the Catholics as possible. So they moved all the way over there, and the Persian line was here, so they met together, they came together, passed on the line to this guy, and he made the Hagia Sophia. And that was kind of the, the merging of the two lines together. So our main line is here, a little bit of knowledge just going on up there, as it is, so people know about it, but don't really care. 
um, and the main scientific advancements are going on down here. So um, from that, uh, a couple of hundred years later, in 610, Muhammad was born and he was the product of this line. He was born kind of uh, south of Persia um, and he wandered up and he would have learned all this new information, this science, and he became the next in line to pass on this knowledge. Now, um, he started Islam, okay, and Islam is built on the ideas of all the other things put together, okay, it's exactly the same, just a different name in a different place, a different time, with a different culture, um, absolutely no difference to it at all. You know, there's a few references here and there that are different, but that can't be exactly the same, can it? Um, especially after 600 years of, of progression. So uh, exactly 40 years after he was born, so well, 30 years after he started Islam, they go and take Jerusalem. They don't go anywhere else, they just go straight for Jerusalem, and the Muslims take Jerusalem back. So they obviously knew um, that how important it was, but there was something there, but the Ark was still there. Muhammad had told him because he passed on the line, and he said, go and get this Ark, and then they went and got it, and they took Jerusalem. Boom, no mess in. Um, straight in there okay and then they took the surrounding area later after this they would have found the artifacts and the line would have progressed and the culture would have grown they didn't find the ark again but you know we still they would have learned from the things they found there's clearly still things there that teach them so what happens is um the muslim empire becomes massive it becomes absolutely huge and the let me look at this the umayyad uh, empire uh, grow and, and in 6, 661 um, and what they happen they expand and again they go straight for South Spain so there's clearly something still in South Spain that needs to be kept so they go all across the bottom uh, or across the top of Africa which is the bottom of the Mediterranean and all up the side and back to Spain so they're taking over all these Roman lands they're destroying them and they're taking whatever's there but you just want to get to Spain for whatever reason there's something in Spain so Granada in um, 711 uh, take hold of Spain, okay? So we have all Spain, all Jerusalem, everything. Now, um, in 750, uh, the Umayyad Empire starts to decline, maybe through um, your successes and, and conflict and whatever, but they don't agree with him anymore and, and they, they try and take over. And because of that, um, is Muslim starts to decline in Jerusalem because it becomes less important. So we've got this line carrying on, uh, probably in Spain um, and in Jerusalem, and you've got a little bit of the um, Romans still going on in Europe. Um, and what happens is it just starts to decline and the Muslim rule starts to weaken. So the Italians and the church and the papal state kind of know there's this knowledge there. They see it before they couldn't get to, to Jerusalem, it was too powerful. Now we see it on the decline. Pope Urban decides to start a crusade for no reason. Oh, I know. Let's go and invade because the Muslims took our city 500 years ago. Let's go and take it back. Okay, uh, fine. It's just an excuse. The people want an excuse to go to war. They go to war. They're fanatics. They, they absolutely almost kill themselves in the crusade. But eventually, um, in... Da, 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 In well, they take over Jerusalem, and 1118, the Templars were formed, the Monks Templar, okay, Knights Templar, uh, and there's a lot of a lot of stuff. This is where it really starts to get complicated, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the Knights Templar, um, a guy in France, okay, so French line, the line must be in France at this point because this French guy um, goes, okay, me and eight other guys, so. Crucial number nine, yeah, number nine is very, very important. Nine guys go straight to Jerusalem and say, we're going to defend the Pilgrim Road, and that's an impossible task. It's like, why are these nine guys trying to defend this Pilgrim Road when it, you couldn't do it with a million guys? Um, so it's just an excuse to go to Jerusalem. They set up shop in Solomon's Old Temple, and they start digging and looking for the Ark. Yeah, they're, they're digging underground and, and making tunnels, and they found these tunnels, and... We're pretty sure they find it um, because then the leader of the, the knights disappears back to Europe and he comes back with like a, like a thousand men. Um, everyone clearly wants to be part of his order and he comes back with a thousand men. And the Knights Templar grow and there's two parts of the Knights Templar, the inner circle, the outer circle. And the inner circle know the truth and they're open to self-development. 
the outer circle are kind of um, just kind of for the media, I guess, you know, but, but the publi publicity of um, Christian knights. Um, so the, the big order of practicing Christianity, um, whereas the, the few in, inside in the inner circle are actually practicing hermetic and alchemistic and your self-development meditational practices. And the whole culture of this group is built on this. They, they, they practice spirituality equal amounts as they practice fighting um, and combat, which makes them warrior monks. And it's really, this is really important stuff. I mean, it, um, it would become so powerful because they have the arc, they have this um, this information, and it's the first time this arc has been touched. So they're applying all the new world knowledge and putting it back to the old system and really expanding and opening up new routes. Okay, and their, their empire, um, they suddenly disappear, they drop, drop, um, drop what they're doing in Jerusalem and they just go and defend all Christian people all over Europe. No need, uh, but they do it anyway because there isn't any threat from Christian people. There's no Muslims in Europe. No, they're all, you know, they're all in um, in, in Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah, they disappear. They go to Scotland as well. They go all the way up to Scotland. No, no Muslims there. Why are you going to Scotland? Okay, so they take over land all over the show. They, I'm... Um, uh, it's been documented that they took something to Scotland and the um, uh, island of Eye, uh, uh, and they they put something in there. Uh, Sky, sorry, they put something in Sky, and that was their headquarters. That was their base. So we were pretty sure that they took this Ark of the Covenant back to Sky. Um, at the same time, as well, while they were in Jerusalem, they were helped by a man called. Um, Hussein I Shabbas, and he created a order of assassins, and they also fought the Muslims, um, but were Muslim themselves, and they were supposedly a great keeper of knowledge, and they were built to protect Jerusalem and the knowledge from outsiders, and they helped the Knights Templar, and they collaborated, and that's why they found the Ark, and that's why they took them back. So the two lines have now merged, and we have one clear line um, in the uh, the Knights Templar, which is now in Sky in Scotland. Um, okay, so uh, the Pope, they managed to get a Pope on the throne when that supports their cause and may become very powerful. Eventually, um, the Christians fight back and a new Pope is on and he doesn't like the fact that Templars have all this power. So he outlaws them and then one day, and uh, Friday the 13th, 1306, he outlaws them all and they all get killed. Except for a handful, maybe nine, typically, which were already in Scotland. And in Scotland, they decide to make a new order called the Freemasons. And the Freemasons directly come from the Knights Templar and have from that inner circle, okay, their beliefs, their structure, exactly the same. We're just putting a new name on it and they're calling it the Freemasons, okay. And they, they come from Scotland, they build uh, all these lodges in Scotland and so on. And their idea is to, again, become secret. Before they were very public, um, well, they had a public outer lair and they had the, the secret inner lair. Now they're just the inner lair. Yeah, there's none of this other other stuff. Nobody knew about the Freemasons. It was a very secret society, as as we've all heard about. Um, so the Freemasons come from the Knights Templar, which come from the Ark, which come from the line. Okay, so they are, you know, the, the line holders at this point. Uh, and that was in... Yeah, 1307, and the Freemasons were officially set up in 1314. So it took seven years for them to develop um, into this this, this organisation, um, very secret organisation, but was meant to um, penetrate the working class to begin with, which then spread into the, the um, upper class later on. Uh, but the idea was to spread the knowledge through England and Europe uh, in a kind of underlying way um, beneath the radar of the church because it was obviously outlawed just like the Gnostics were and so on. Um, so we come to uh, 1486 when Cornelius Agrippa um, creates the Witch's Hammer, which is how to punish um Hermeticum and witches and everything else. This is a you know the witches the witches hammer is how to kill witches, how to identify witches. But at the same time, <laughs> under a different name, he also writes the um, Hermes uh, Corpius, which is basically a gathering of all the Hermetic uh, scriptures they have found and put them together. So on one hand, he's he's telling people how to find witches, and then the other hand is he's, he's helping. 
uh, Hermeticum and the occult uh, progress at the same time. And this is almost like a front. So um, he's saying, these are what witches are like. Go and find them. Go and kill witches. But actually, what I'll do is, beneath the table, I'm going to teach people how to avoid that, but carry on practicing at the same time. Okay, so it's quite clever, really. You're sending Christians off one way to kill people when really we should be going somewhere else. Um, and just after that, uh, in 14, well, uh, 1404, about the same time, 1484, the Rosicrucian started, again, with nine members, okay, started by one guy, and nine members. So uh, the Freemasons actually carried on, yeah, the Freemasons carry on, but this inner group within the Freemasons, again, the centre circle, um, become the Rosicrucians, okay? So there's, there's real, very important, Rosicrucian, Red Cross, Templars, fairly obvious. Um, uh, the, the performance is the same, the initiation is the same, the only difference is they're working on more scientific orders. So uh, why everybody's going to be going after the Freemasons, uh, they actually break off, start a new group, and nobody knows about it, so they're, they're not going to be hunted down anymore. This happens again and again and again. Um, one of the last members of the Freemasons uh, that would have you know, carried on the Rosicrucian line was Marcello Fassini. And there's a lot of stuff in Italy now. So um, with the Renaissance, uh, everything moved to Italy. So we can be pretty sure that the line moved from England over to Italy as that's the new centre of progression. Um, we get a few guys from there, Copernicus. We all know Copernicus as first person to tell um, to mention. Doesn't actually want to prove because he doesn't want to be burned as a witch. Um, so he just kind of floats the idea out there, but doesn't say it's this is how it actually is. He just kind of goes, "Oh, maybe it could be." Um, so don't burn me for it. And he he says the earth, uh, the sun, uh, yeah, the earth revolves around the sun and so on, which is like a big shock for everybody, but doesn't make it official. Okay. Um, there's all, a few other guys, so he's like the astronomy guy, he's like the astronomy um, line holder, um, forgive me if I get the pronunciation of this wrong, uh, Paracelsus is the alchemy guy, and he, he's purely on alchemy science, you know, he's, he's progressing knowledge in all sorts of ways, and he sets up various colleges, and he's known as, as the big modern day um, guy, a lot of the a lot of those, um, big research comes from the um, Renaissance period, even though it was built on ideas previous, um, you have to understand that it's not new ideas, it all comes from knowledge previously done that has been brought to a good level and then they've just simply revamped it and thrown it back out there. Okay, but again, uh, Renaissance heavy Christian um, activity, really big, so they kind of have to do it under the radar, um, which is, is really tricky stuff. So uh, there's quite, there's absolutely tons of <clears throat> people um, in the Rosicrucians um, that are flying around and so many scientists just work on different things um, <clears throat> and the biggest one is Giordano Bruno um, and he is um, Italian and he is so obstinate about his beliefs he's so out there he just denies the church he says the church is wrong um, and this is he's basically doing what I'm doing but then and obviously it's illegal effectively um, and he's saying that everything you believe about Christians is wrong. This is what they did. This is where it all comes from. It comes from Egyptian, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's perfectly true. Um, he can back it up with evidence and everything else. But he gets burnt alive at the stake because he's in Christian. He's saying, saying Jesus isn't the son of God and God doesn't exist and all this sort of thing. So, and he, he creates a group called the Jordinios, um, and they're, they're pretty anti-government. Yeah, and, and they're kind of working around. But they're, they are part of the Rosicrucians. Um, okay, and it, he has a direct successor called uh, Tommaso Campanella. And he's doing what Bruno did, but in secret, because he goes, well, Bruno got killed for what he said. I believe him, but I'm just not going to do it publicly. So he's working underneath um, the government, and, you know, he's becoming part of the government. He's trying to infiltrate um, Rosicrucian beliefs into... Um, the Christian rule uh, and another one, uh, Galileo exactly the same time, him and Galileo were very very close, Galileo was a scientist um, obviously had his, his um, theories and what happened is uh, Galileo was imprisoned uh, so he couldn't affect anybody else with his bad um, bad behaviour as such, his beliefs um, and there's quite a few of these people uh, knocking around, I'm going to go into this more detail in another day Good book um, to read, and this I'll mention later on. Uh, there's all sorts of people. Um, 
especially going into kind of uh, the Polish area as well and the Czech area, um, King uh, King Rudolf II um, was a big supporter of the Hermeticum and, and scientific beliefs as well. So, um, yeah, Galileo was imprisoned and Tommaso Com Campanella was kind of his associate. So them two kind of corresponded between each other and helped each other out um, and passed notes and all sorts. Um, Tommaso also got um, imprisoned for a while and he had two... Um, kind of writers that wrote in their name but his stuff uh, and that was Wilhelm Wentz and Tobias Adami uh, and they in, they were in Germany and Italy and they published his works for him and um, without anybody knowing, uh, knowing that it was actually him. Uh, influence spread all the way to London with William Harvey um, and he just passed on knowledge. They, they all kind of progressed different aspects of the knowledge together. Um, so, in 1601, the Rosicrucians were publicly outed by uh, Pastel. Um, so, you know, in a, in a, good, in a good way, 200 years of secrecy and development and throwing these ideas out there. But it's time for a bit of a change. So if we get this guy, Pastel, to publicly out them, and he, he basically goes, yep, yeah, actually, these Rosicrucians are about, and it was the Freemasons. Um, they come directly from the Freemasons. Um, we don't like them, we sh you should get rid of them. So um, the Rosicrucians moved to Germany, which is where all the new things are happening in England, and they become the Rosencruz, which basically in German means Rosicrucians, or Rosicrucians. Um, not a massive name change there, it's literally a language change. But for some reason, the church goes, oh, that's a different group. Um, and a lot of people actually still read it, think they're two different groups. A lot of people, even from the Rosicrucians, uh, will look at that and go, that's a different group, that is. But no, it's the same group, um, just change the name and change the location. Uh, this is very important, as the they actually become, the, the change to the Rosencruz is actually quite significant, because it's, it's the first time they managed to get a Pope um, which believes in Hermeticum law, and their rituals, so they kind of become more popular, a bit more understanding, okay, uh, and there's the other group, the Jesu Jesuits at the time, still absolutely hate hate the occult, uh, the cultists, um, and see them as evil, um, but the the Christians start to warm up because they've got a Pope um, which believes in it, which is, you know, fair enough, um, they even start to have artifacts from Egypt shipped to, um, to Rome and Germany and everywhere else, uh, and Vatican, which is why the, the Cleopatra's needle is in Vatican. Um, so I'd close out. Uh, there was a, a guy called John Worthington who who makes a council of twelve. Um, I forget the name of it now, but he he has this council of men, and they all sit and kind of rule together under this pope, and they decide what's going on in the world. So we're pretty much for once um, they're in the same position as the Knights Templars were, less public. Uh, and very political, but they have this group and they pretty much control Europe um, in a good way. Uh, they try to make scientific advancements. Um, some of the members are um, William Viscount, um, or Viscount. Uh, Samuel Hartlib was a very, very big uh, science, science guy at the time. Um, John Wilkins, uh, Charles Lewis, um, he was king. Uh, Charles Lewis was the uh, son of Michael Meyer and he was a student of Robert Flood, and Robert Flood was a very well-known um, science practitioner. Okay, uh, yeah, there was Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Stewart, uh, Queen of the Bohemia. Um, she um, had several sons, and a couple of those sons belonged to this council. Okay, so it was quite a high-up council. A lot of um, a lot of blue bloods uh, from the Czech as well, and um, France and nobility. Um, yeah, uh, Robert Boyle was in there as well. Uh, he was a very, very important uh, guy in alchemy. Um, and Theodore Hack in London. So we can see the influence has gone kind of all, all over Europe. Um, so they're, they're still practicing traditional um, hermetic science uh, with all the spirituality involved as well. Now, this uh, becomes a bit of a problem when the uh, Jesuits uh, decide to fight back and outlaw all this this sort of thing. So they gain a bit of power, and what happens is um, people in this council uh, they get a new council because they knew that these people have been tarnished with this brush 
of being heretics. So um, what we do is we get we, each one of them gets a new successor, and these new successors actually um, condemn them themselves. They go, "Oh, hematic um, work is bad. Alchemy is bad." Yeah, it's all against religion, blah, blah, blah. But what they're actually doing is saying that, but practicing it in secret. Okay, So they then turn into pure science. What we have now today is pure science, pure maths, pure chemistry. Chemistry comes from alchemy, and that's what it is. They're turning, they're turning the, the spiritual into pure science. So they're, they're working on the science, but they lose lose why. They lose the self, self-involvement of it. But they're still carrying on the knowledge in their own way. And a big, big support of this was Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton was the biggest science man of his day. Um, and he, he did have a rival, actually, um, for Gottfried Wilhelm uh, Leibniz in Germany. And both of them together, um, what they did were pure scientists. Um, and he got lots of recognition under the Jesuits because it was non-religious. There was no religious acts. It was all pure science. Um so they got all the works published and became very recognised. He became a sir, everything else, uh, and discovered gravity. But all of his works, when he died, they found 190, um, at least, uh, copies of um, alchemic and hermetic texts, which uh, basically, that's where he built his, his work on. So even though he was saying it in a science way and it was being accepted, it was actually built on hermetic law, and people weren't happy about that when they found out, and we kind of covered it up a little bit. Um, so Isaac Newton was actually part of his council. He, he was the next line holder and he was very, very spiritual indeed, despite what you might think already. Um, so, yeah, this order passes on in secret and they practice pure science. Now, in 1777, um, the order goes to, um, they go to Hungary and um, they start the Illuminati. Okay, 1777, um, in Bulgaria, uh, yeah, Hungary. Um, so, exactly the same again. Okay, the Rosicrucians, the Rosencruz, kind of carry on with their massive following group um, of scientists and whatever, and they carry on as they do. But then the inner circle of that group split and they turn into the um, Illuminati. We know this because all the modern day texts from the Golden Order and all sorts of other other um, sources from people within each order say that um, the line, the order, has an obligation to change every 111 years. So we see the roughly 1333, uh, the involvement of the um, Templars into the Freemasons. Uh, 1444 didn't need um, due reform because nobody knew about them. Uh, 1555, we start with the um, uh, Rose, uh, Rosicrucians, and then 1666 we start with the Rosencruz, 1777 uh, the Illuminati, okay, and it's not the Illuminati or like um, off, off angels and demons, this is the Illuminati Church, and it's nothing to do with Satan, and it's nothing to do with the New World Order, but it's about now, although they, they're probably the offshoot of this, um, they have nothing to do with the spiritual side of this, um, uh, yeah, it's totally different, the Illuminati were purely dedicated to self-development, um, again, they were given the title of devil worshippers because, yeah, they were against the church. They weren't against the church, but they were um, they weren't they weren't working with the church. Put it that way. They were purely scientific, and they were working underneath the church's radar um, and trying to get involved in the church and try and take over its hierarchy so we could practice in freedom. There's nothing satanic about it. Um, it's purely science and spirituality and development, given this label, as it has been done with the Gnostics and so on. Um, so that carries on 1777 and and then in 1888 or just before 1888 by the time it's 1888 it's just about being developed um, it becomes the order of the golden dawn okay and that's very interesting that's led by a um, guy I think called Mathers um, at the time and another guy at the same time a very famous guy Alistair Crowley um, becomes part of the order and he pretty much does carry on the line we know this because of his achievements um, we say achievements he's again tarnished with being a devil worshipper and all of you know saint lover and and all this but really just like all the others he's practicing science and self-development and he's trying to link the lines together we, we can see from his teachings the book of Foth, Foth being you know from Egypt and the guy who wrote the emerald tablet so um, we can prove that his his teachings and his um, beliefs were passed on from from there. 
um, he had a successor called uh, Israel Rigade, and he wrote a book, and that basically told everyone exactly how um, the Golden Order works. There's nothing devil about it. It's all science um, and spiritual. Um, there's nothing bad in there, really, unless you are purely um, like a proper devout Christian. In which case, it just is conflict of interest. But um, you know, it's still not bad. It still doesn't result in being burnt at the cross. Um, so, uh, yeah, the golden order is on. Um, we actually know that the Illuminati kind of also passes um, with a Bavarian angel, and the story that kind of involves Hitler um, and World War Two. Uh, so. Um, Hitler was part of uh, the line, um, believe it or not, and uh, you know, there's lots of different um, theories about this. But basically, uh, he yeah he, drew, he he had access to higher powers. Um, the the symbol of the swastika is uh, from Egypt. He's trying to build his city of the sun, um, but on a global scale through uh, genocide. Um, not probably not the best way to go about it, but uh, that's what he did. He felt that was the way to go, and he did it. He had access to all this knowledge, all this development, spiritual development. He had, you know, all these powers supposedly. Um, he had psychics working for him. He he built um, spacecraft effectively. Um, uh, everyone thought were from the UFOs, but actually um, it was the same aircraft that uh, Da Vinci drew, and Da Vinci himself was part of the line. So this knowledge has been passed on through him, through either higher powers or um, in writing and so on. Uh, so you can kind of see if the knowledge was passed on you. Uh, uh, it's a touchy subject, uh, but you can see Hitler's point of view. You know, he. he um, I'm not saying it's, bad, it's good or bad or whatever. Um, I'm just saying, if you look at it from his angle, as we, we should look at everybody's angle. It doesn't matter what you do. You should always try and understand it from every point of view. Um, and he was trying to build a city of the sun, and he'd just seen that most people, like 99% of the world, was not spiritual anymore. And he was just trying to clear that out and create this, this spiritual grounding um, where people can redevelop um, from scratch. Um, but, yeah, I mean, conflict, you know, is always going to be, um, if, if it had won, uh, everyone's seen that film High Rise, if Germany had won the war, um, then yeah, it would have been written differently. He would have been a hero, blah, 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 because he would have ruled the world. Um, but he failed, and, you know, we, we always look at him in a bad way for that. So, you know, I'm sure we did equally bad things in our side as well. But let's not go into that right now. But yeah, Hitler was part of the line um, and had access to all this knowledge, just like the Golden Order of Dawn. So it was a kind of these two orders fighting each other effectively, Golden Order of Dawn um, in the higher places and uh, Nazi Germany. OK, but yeah, Alistair Crowley, uh, he was actually on our side. Um, he was he was English. So uh, even though we slated him with all this um, horrible Satanism, he was actually probably working well for us. But he ended up getting expelled and going to Tunisia. Um, and he, he set up the line in Germany when after the war. Um, he, he made the first. He basically started a piece. He was trying to connect England and Germany together by um, creating a second hermetic uh, golden order of dawn in Germany as well um, and bringing it all back uh, to how it was before. Um, and that kind of brings us almost up to date. Uh, yeah, so there you go. So you can kind of see from there that the knowledge has been passed on um, all the way through. And you have these little offshoots of groups um, that carry on the teachings they were taught, but kind of aren't involved in the jump ship, kind of change name, change routine, act. So they're very stuck in their own ways, which so they seem out of date. So like looking at the Rosicrucians that still exist today, um, they look really out of date because, yeah, they're not moving on. Um, they've been left to carry on with their own, own devices because they're so devout on what they're, they're thinking. We don't see outside the box and we don't continue the, the movement, whereas the movement has actually changed from them into um, the Rosencruz and so on and so on to the Golden Order of Dawn. Um, yeah, uh, and that's it. That's kind of, that's like 8,000 8, years of history just summed up into one group. But hopefully what you can see there is that all these religions and all, all these secret societies and practicing groups, they're all part of the same thing. We're all just trying to be spiritual 
and develop ourselves internally. Um, it's not about taking over the world like this um, supposed new world order um, is trying to do. Uh, it, it's not about that. It's about um, if everyone was just to spend a little bit of time and develop their own inner self, then that will reflect onto everybody else and, and build up a better world. Um, and this city of the sun would happen. Uh, it, it's not, uh, this video isn't about views and political views. Um, it's just about facts and knowledge. Now, the, all this information that I've shared with you um, will be in my up and coming book, which I've finished, almost finished the first draft. Um, so I, once I've got a few more drafts under, under my belt, I will then publish. Um, any more information you would like to, to know, just feel free to contact me with your views. Um, so I've tried to uh, include uh, as accurate dates as possible and information. Obviously, I couldn't put it all into, into this video, but there is a lot, of, lot more information out there. Um, and I encourage you to go and check up on these facts and go out there and study and learn with an open mind um, and read some of the books um, out there because they're all, they're all right. They're all, they all have the right information. They all have the correct, correct facts. The, you just have to um, look at why, why did this group stop um, influencing culture? Why did it stop having people in it which um, give scientific uh, development? And the reason for that is because the line moved on to somewhere else and, and those people came from, from that line. Um, so it's our duty uh, these days to... To find this knowledge and keep it keep it going, um, and to kind of teach others about it, try and get it people to be open minded, um, not in a preachy way, but just people to understand. understand. It's I say, it's about self development um, and not control. Uh, it's as simple as that. So if you have any more questions, feel free to um, email me at intensityfitness.co.uk. So I'll leave a note under this video. Um, and post information, share it, share it. The more people who see this, better. I know it's it's not particularly um, interesting video of, of you know, it's just me talking, but hopefully you'll uh, you'll find some use in it, and you can just listen to it and gain some idea of, of where your um, scientific heritage comes from. Okay, so uh, I was Andrew Platt, and I'll I'll talk to you again soon.